Co-Impact and Dasra are partners in the growth of collaborative philanthropy, which combines grants for larger bets to drive outcomes at scale. Co-Impact, a philanthropic collaboration that includes Richard Chandler, Bill and Melinda Gates, Jeff Skoll, the Rockefeller Foundation, and Rohini and Nandan Nilakani has selected Project ECHO, which stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes from the University of New Mexico Health Sciences Center to receive a 10 million US dollar grant. This has recently been matched by the Tata Trusts. The collaborative 20 million US dollar grant will help Project ECHO work in India in the areas of tuberculosis, mental health, hepatitis C, and capacity building for the healthcare workers under the Ayushman Bharat scheme. Thank you. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> now Dasra, Co-Impact, and Project ECHO are collaborating to launch a giving circle, which in addition to fostering a community of philanthropists in health tech, will enable the institutional capacity and capability building efforts needed to accelerate Project ECHO's audacious goal of helping one billion people by 2025. Nice. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our next panel, which will speak to Project ECHO and societal platforms, but at the forefront of this is the importance of digital and how it will play into the transformation of India. Good afternoon, and welcome to this discussion. I was telling uh, Dr. Sunil Anand uh, that as an amateur musician in my life, I always had the dream of standing on this stage, <laughs> the Royal Opera House, and here, lo and behold, we are, and so, this is not about making presentations. This should be about performance. And since we are both amateurs at even the work that we are doing, we thought it's about improvisation. So today's session is more of an improvisation of what we have been going through as, together as a journey for the last couple of years now. Yes. And so probably I would like to begin by requesting uh, Dr. Anand to talk a little bit about ECHO and tee us off, and then we get into this conversation. Thank you, Sanjeev, and thank you, everyone, and thank you, Dasra, for inviting me. It's a great honor to address so many people and like-minded people, all, all who want to do good. Project ECHO actually is a movement that demonopolizes knowledge and builds capacity to get best practices of healthcare into underserved areas. It also reduces disparities in the hope that people all across the country in India get the same level of care that they get in uh, metros. For us, too many patients and providers are moving either to get or deliver healthcare, and that needs to change. And the reason why Project ECHO was based is the founder, Dr. Sanjeev Arora, is a professor, a distinguished professor of medicine and gastroenterology at the University of New Mexico in the United States. And he saw a 43-year-old widowed mother of two children come to his clinic with a 15-year history of hepatitis C, and now with cancer, they were cancer and he could do nothing, and she died. So he looked at it not as another patient that passed through, but as why did this lady have to die when in the country you got all the money, you got all the expertise, and you got all the insurance to pay for it. And the reason was that she could not get the treatment where she lived by the doctor she knew and trusted. She couldn't come to, when asked, she said, I can't travel to 50 kilometers or miles you know, um, up and down with two children, I have to take them out of school, I don't have money. And Sanjeev read that as a systemic failure. And he said, I need to move knowledge and not patients and providers. And that's how the tagline came. So what he set up was Project ECHO, which is a tech-enabled model that builds capacity and puts the treatment in the hands of physicians who are in the periphery, if I could use that phrase. So what he did was he went out and got 21 general practitioners, nurse assistants in the private or the prison sector and said, come on, let's treat hepatitis C patients. Let me handhold you. And they were reluctant because they'd never done that and this was complicated. So he followed the medical model, medical school model, how we were taught. 
that every week for two hours, at least 21 centers would join in. They would bring their patients. They would discuss their patients. Every, you would bring one, but learn from 10 patients, and therefore, co-manage these patients. Over an 18-month period, they did this, and then he published the results in New England Journal of Medicine in the year 2011, showing that the 21 sites that were peripheral, general practitioners and nurse assistants, got the same result as the University of New Mexico's team-based care, which meant hepatologists, pharmacists, psychiatrists, all present at one time. And once he proved that, Project Echo got accepted. And then more and more universities in the United States took it on, the Howard, Cleveland Clinic, MD Anderson, not only run these echo clinics, but multiple. MD Anderson runs nine clinics on various uh, cancers. To the extent that President Obama in December 2016 signed what's called the Echo Act, asking all healthcare institutions to look at Project Echo to build capacity and scale. Once that happened, the world just took it over. Today we are in 34 countries, over 200 partners. Now, why did it really catch on? We tried to analyze it, and we looked at it and said, whenever there is dynamic complexity, you need team-based care. An individual cannot do it. Like um, my previous speaker uh, came up and asked the audience a question. Let me ask the audience this question. How many of you would give your brother or your sister or your child a manual to drive a car, and once they've read it, give him or her the keys? Any hands up? Thank you, none. So why would you want to do in medicine? Remember, knowledge is increasing exponentially today, and a newer method needs to come in to do this. And Project ECHO, tech-enabled platform, is the one. In India, we have over 18 very active academic hubs, PGI, Chandigarh, All Institute, NIMANS, ICMR, building more than, running more than 30 programs covering mental health and many, many diseases. Tuberculosis, mental health, hepatitis, cancer screening, palliative care, treatment of cancers. And today, the government has said that this is a wonderful platform to scale. We are the platform for tube, national tuberculosis program, we have the program for the viral hepatitis elimination program, the vector-borne disease program, mental health across the entire country, and according to the mental health attack, one council in every district, they have to have and train. And this is where Project ECHO is today. But like uh, we had uh, doctors had problems or we had problems treating patients, ECHO has also now got a problem. What's the problem? How do I scale so rapidly with so much demand on my system? The current tech-enabled platform for us is not good enough. It's not letting, going to let me go from, uh, let's say, 20 or 30 hubs, as we call it, to a 200, 300, 400. It's not going to happen. So we ourselves are looking at how do I involve society at large, have a larger, much larger digital platform, or what we call as a digital echo, and that's where our association with Step and uh, Sanjay Prohet Societal Platform comes in to build a, really a large digital platform that will help echo scale and keep up at the pace at which our demand is growing. And with that, I'll let uh, Sanjay San, uh, San, uh, San take it over, and then we'll, we'll have a nice chat and see what we can do. Thanks, Thank Sunil. And so, um, Let's do a quick rewind back in history and then come back forward into where Sunil brought us. Uh, uh, sometime in the middle of 2016, um, there was an idea that was sparked uh, by Rohini and Nandan Nilekani on, can we re reimagine how we drive change with speed, scale, and sustainable, in a very, very sustainable manner? And the idea was coined as societal platforms. Let me give you a brief introduction to that. Rohini coined the term, she's right here. Um, and the whole thing became, uh, started as an inquiry of, we see that the sector around us uh, is obviously doing and working through very, very complex problems. Um, and, and dealing with dynamic complex problem, the word that Sunil used is a very different it may require a different paradigm of thinking rather than thinking of complicated problems. Our issues are more complex and dynamically complex. Our problems actually grow faster many a times than our ability to solve them because the rate at which we may end up treating patients, that has to be faster than the rate at which 
the demographics of the country are moving and more newer healthcare problems are coming up. The rate at which we educate our children has to be faster than the rate at which we are producing children as a demography and so on and so forth. So we have a situation where there's a high probability that the rate at which we solve is, is likely to be challenged by the rate at which the problem is growing. And hence, at any point in time, after having done a lot, you still feel a sense of stagnation. So speed certainly was an important consideration. Scale was a certainly important consideration. Uh, anywhere across the world, when we discuss the developmental problems of a country like India, our least count is a million, and we always talk about 100 million, 200 million. Even ECHO's India mission is about impacting 400 million lives. And so uh, the question is, uh, how do we deal with that kind of a scale? And if you look at some of the largest work that is happening in the development sector, that would be addressing a small part of this complex large scale problem. And third is the question of sustainability, because uh, it, sustainability is not about whether you can earn revenue and make it financially viable. It is about whether the equilibrium of the society changes to a different place from which there is no going back. And that can only happen with very effective coordination and cooperation of Samaj Bazaar and Sarkar, as we say, which is the, the state, the civil society, and the, and, the, and the private sector. And so we started kind of debating these questions and looking around as to what are the kind of questions that we need to answer, because the going narrative at that point and still is, in a large extent, is scale what works. And so that narrative leads us in a direction of saying, do a great project, prove that it works, and then look for resources to replicate. And there are end models or end pathways to replication, ranging from creating more distributed network structures to even growing large institutions, et cetera. And then we said, yeah, that's great. And I think the amount of work that goes on is phenomenal, and we're deeply, deeply uh, inspired by that. And then we started asking a question saying, what works at scale? Uh, and that may not be the same question because scaling what works is a very different paradigm from understanding what really works at scale. And so we started looking at very large, complex movements that potentially are the ones that work at scale. And the good answer to that question of what works at scale is, I don't know. And we said if the real answer to that question is, I don't know, then we have to have a different mechanism to organize ourselves to deal with such large scale problems. And you would see in, in Sunil's description of what ECHO does was it's not that ECHO, the movement, knew everything. It was its deep recognition that it does not know anything and that, that the rest of the organization, the rest of the ecosystem has to figure it out. And that led us to the thinking around saying if we have to approach this question from these three dimensions, then one, we have to harmonize a very uh, effective network of actors in Samaj Bazar Sarkar. So that's the first tenet of a societal platform. Second is, it's not that we have to create solutions, master them, and distribute them, but we have to distribute the ability to solve to the entire network of actors and players across the, uh, across the ecosystem. And third is that there will be a lot of scarce resources, expertise, skills, um, good answers to very complex questions. And we have to, uh, he used the word demonopolize, but we have to ensure that those are very easily available. How do you make scarce resources highly abundant? That kind of pushed us forward into this direction saying if we have to do that, then we have to sort of try and reimagine the way we drive large scale change by thinking through where have we seen this before? Is this, isn't this strangely familiar? Because if you reflect back on our civilization's development on top of large scale infrastructure such as for example GPS, the entire thought process there was that take one, answer, one question and answer it extremely well at a very large scale and make that scarce uh, resource completely abundant. For example, the ability to locate ourselves. And if we can do that, then there are many more things that layer by layer over time get built on top of it. And so what's the GPS of education? What's the GPS of healthcare? What's the GPS of, uh, of water, sanitation, livelihoods? What are those fundamental building blocks that if you made it available to hundreds of thousands of uh, actors in the entire social ecosystem um, would change and move the equilibrium uh, slowly and steadily towards a better stable equilibrium from where there's no coming back. A lot of experiments started then. And if we started working in the area of education, of course, the XTEP Foundation, uh, which was set up by Rohini Nandan and our colleague Shankar Marwara were working on how do you get um, uh, access to literacy and numeracy uh, across 200 million children, then we started asking a question saying, how do you lend money to 100 million first-time formal borrowers? 
how do you essentially provide um, affordable tertiary and secondary health care to 100 million families? How do you uh, work on water security or how do you enable the ecosystem to improve the water security of 100 million uh, people? And so how do you even look at that question and start from the question then try and sort of work backwards? And that led us to five important principles which I just want to share with you. One is how do you build large scale infrastructure as a public good? As a country we have uh, been on our journey to develop our physical infrastructure and there's a huge opportunity to leapfrog when it comes to our digital infrastructure. But digital infrastructure as a public good that can be used by actors in different parts of our society to do different kinds of things. So what's such infrastructure for education? What's such an, what's such an infrastructure for financial inclusion? Which can be used by hundreds of actors to develop the solutions that they need to build. Hence, the second principle, how do we inspire co-creation? so that we distribute the ability to solve, that different players in the sector are able to get the infrastructure and build better and better solutions over time. Because in our context and diversity, no one solution is ever going to, to help us. It has to be hundreds of solutions. And we have to embrace diversity rather than standardize and embrace replication. And so how do we do that? The third important principle was how do we catalyze the network, a network of actors uh, across Samaj Bazar and Sarkar. The fourth important aspect that came into being was that how do we essentially go and create a digital backbone or a digital infrastructure that allows speed, allows rapid diffusion. Uh, and the fifth and a very important one was that when we go at this scale and at the speed, we generate data. And how do you use data to empower the ecosystem? How do you use data to essentially help the entire uh, development uh, efforts to find more focus, more precision? And so that in some ways is societal platform thinking. When people tell me about societal platform, it invokes the image of an object, a platform, right? Uh, but essentially, it's not the object. It's about a way of rethinking or reimagining a problem. And Echo has been the one. So way back in 2016, and one day, uh, Sanjeev Arora called, and he said, uh, I want to impact a billion lives. And we said, yes, that's an interesting conversation to have. And since then, it's been an interesting two-year journey to saying, if you want to impact a billion lives, how do we apply these principles to what ECHO is doing and reimagine what the, the network effects of ECHO are, what the co-creation environments of ECHO are, and what the shared digital infrastructure of ECHO is, and how ECHO becomes better and better at distributing the ability to solve in the hands of hundreds of thousands of doctors and, and medical professionals, <coughs> excuse me, who are going to actually go ahead and make lives uh, improve all over other countries. So coming back to uh, Dr. Sunil, these ideas is the one we have been uh, sort of brainstorming and tag teaming on reimagining the future of ECHO. So tell us more about what's your imagination of ECHO India now that we are in India and you had the ECHO India Trust. So what's going on and how some of these things are playing in your, in your mind as you're scaling in India? Right. I think I'll just... <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Time to stand? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll stand. Yeah, that's fine. See, remember, whenever we want to look at the present, somebody said, go back to history. When Sanjeev Arora started in 2011 or 2003, and 11 onwards, it really grew. He was a small team. But then as his demand went up and up, he used to have these trainings every month. And it's gone so large today that he's booked for the next four or five months. He can't train anymore. So he looked at himself as a limitation now. I can't train more, what do I do? So he appointed a lot of institutions around the world, MD Anderson, one of them, um, American Academy of Pediatrics, one of them, Echo India is one of them, where he said, why don't you now cut the umbilical cord and you start training more and more institutions? So we started to train more and more institutions. Now we've reached the stage with the number of programs I said about the government, such large programs, it's impossible for me to do it as well. So we've gone one step ahead and said, all right, we picked up NIMANS to start with, National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences in Bangalore, and said, why don't you start training other institutions that deal with neurosciences to do echoes? Likewise, for cancer, we picked up an ICMR institute and said, why don't you start training for cancers? Likewise, next move is Tata Memorial Hospital for treatment, palliative care out of Trimendium. So we ourselves are undergoing a dramatic change in the way we do it. Currently, what we're doing in a physical form, we'll call everybody for two and a half days and train them how to do it. And if all of us live such busy lives, to take two and a half days off a doctor from a government hospital is almost an impossibility. So that is my limitation factor here. 
And I think you mentioned some interesting things here as we are discussing this here. That one, the idea of how to do this is, is increasingly more and more liberated from the confines of echo, if you will, right? Because initially when we used to talk about, we used to talk about a hub and spoke model, and then they started talking about a hub, hub and spoke model, and now they're talking about a spoke and spoke models. It's getting increasingly distributed in the network, uh, and, and that's where uh, it's been an interesting evolution over time. And the other that thing that uh, is very interesting, you didn't mention the statistic, that the rate at which the knowledge multiplies in the, in the medical industry and the rate at which it diffuses are vastly different. And so what you're trying to accomplish is how do you diffuse that knowledge at an extremely high speed? And so now what? Now that you have got these hubs sort of warming up and, and you're using existing infrastructure, it's not that you're creating a parallel remedial infrastructure, you're essentially using an existing infrastructure, which is the existing institutions and the existing doctors and the existing ASHA workers. See, ECHO, first of all, recognizes and we accept the fact that we cannot do it alone. We need to collaborate with more and more people. That's the only way we go. We accept that we are not the, probably the best. There are better people there who could collaborate and carry this mission forward. So what we're looking at now is to try and address where is my barrier. One is barrier to entry. To enter ECHO, you've got to come sign documents. You've got to come for two-day training, etc. Can I you know, sort of get rid, eliminate this barrier to entry? If I've eliminated the barrier of entry, can I then accelerate the adoption? Do they really need my help all the time? Can I put up on this platform, for example, where they can draw the knowledge out, know what else somebody else is doing, discover other partners that they could collaborate without having to go through me? So we need to decentralize even this process by recognizing, A, I can't do it alone, two, I need to collaborate, and three, I identify my barriers and find how to overcome them and remove the barriers. That's where we are looking at sort of going. Only then, if I'm able to do that, will the impact that I'm making currently will actually increase. Otherwise, I will be my own limiting factor. I need to remove myself from that. And that's why we believe some other uh, system, or just if I, for better word, let me call it a digital echo, will come in that will remove these barriers to entry, earlier adoption, et cetera. That's what and I the whole idea of digital echo was a very interesting one because most of the time when we talk about digital, people say, can you build me an app? Can you build me a portal? Can you build me an ERP kind of a system? Uh, whereas the imagination that uh, is, is there in the societal platform thinking and the one that we're also working on with echo was, it's about creating digital and data services that can be used to build many such applications so it's about building the fundamental infrastructure. So Digital Echo is a fundamental infrastructure which allows for easy access. Now, by whom? It could be one of their hubs, it could be one of their institutions, it could be one of their spokes that in the future would open it, it could be one of the government programs. So different kinds of programs can find ways to enter Echo and work with Echo rather than only one way to work with Echo, which would have been a classical app or a portal saying you go here and you do what you want to do. The second important thing which you talked about is how do you essentially get people to access knowledge, et cetera, and making the entire knowledge capability available as a public good, as, as a large uh, open resource base, but not only saying here it is, it's not like a YouTube or a Google saying go find out what you want, but it's extremely, uh, Echo has an interesting philosophy which you don't mention, which is all teach or learn, which essentially is that everybody who participates in Echo either teaches or learns. So how do you create this teaching learning interactions in a very, very large scale way. And you might want to touch upon the whole aspect of building communities or practices around your different uh, sciences, the last point before we move over to the audience. One thing I'll uh, also add, one of the big advantages that we are seeing when we collaborate with different partners, they come up with a lot of other information that we never knew about. One of the very good innovations that people come out is WhatsApp. Typically what Echo does is holds the clinic, as I said, then we have a digital library where people can go and assess knowledge of papers from all over the world. But then we realized in these clinics, the WhatsApp had a tremendous amount of knowledge. How do you incorporate that knowledge and bring it onto our platform so that everybody can learn? By community practice, what happens is that when we spread, more and more partners join in. And then let's say somebody is doing hepatitis C. The next one starts a clinic of rheumatoid arthritis. The third one will start on diabetes. And then cross-references start. So hepatitis people will go to that doctor that's doing hepatitis C, and whole community of practice there starts looking after 
all the diseases in that city rather than just uh, the one that they are, uh, you know, sort of echoes passing through. I think I, I, and just to kind of close with that reflection, that the whole point that if you, if you use some kind of a closed platform infrastructure, you don't have visibility into what's happening. And what ECHO is moving towards is to get a real-time insight as to what's going on, what are the doctors working on, what are the things that are being questioned, what are the open issues, what are they learning, what are they solving, and making them richer and richer over time. So initially starting from a video conferencing infrastructure plus a data storage infrastructure, now they've moved into a situation where it's a much more wider open environment is what we're saying. So I think Neera is out here saying, you guys need to stop. I had quickly two questions for, uh, to understand yes. whether we got across. Yes. And they're right here, right? Yeah. So what do you think? Technology impact, impacts, Im impact of societal initiatives. Let us train stakeholders on how to use technology or distribute free discounted software, build minimal open digital platforms, let the users innovate. And technology has a limited role to play, so this is so kind of... So while we vote, I'm going to open it up for questions, and I'm going to take from the balcony first. No? Yesterday, there were so many wanting to ask questions. Anyone down here? Yes, in the corner over there. There, yes. Um, hi. Um, my question basically is, um, when you talk about all the actors, right, government and um, markets and also the civil society, what uh, I'm not understanding is, first of all, who is coming in from the government side as actors? Are these sort of uh, outlier individuals who are generally interested in open data and open platforms. And secondly, what is the incentive for buy-in from them? Because although India has been like in leadership in certain open platforms and openness, uh, there was actually a pushback and the situation reversed. So in this kind of shared system where the government participation is or the state participation is also necessary, uh, what is the incentive for the government to, for example, make its data more yeah, open okay. and so on and so forth. Yeah. So I'm going to take this question and I'm going to take another question. Okay. So you can prepare for this first. Yes, there was another question here. Yes, go ahead. Uh, hi, Vishal from Madrid. Oh, hi, Vishal. Uh, hi. Uh, my question is, uh, I see the strategy and the pathways. What I'm not clear on is what is the mindset change you trying to bring about and how will this pathway bring about that mindset change? Sure. So Sanjay, can you take the government question? Sunil, can you take the pathway question? Okay. 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 So um, actually, it'd be good to switch it because he's been working with the ministry. Okay, and the government. switch it. Yes. All right. Okay. <laughs> right. See, to inform the government is very essential for us because the numbers are going to come from there. They actually believe in or have a good infrastructure, actually existing for us to tap into. Like Sanjay said, we don't put up anything new in it anymore. We tap the current system. The government is actually willing to share a lot of the, what we need, the program data, they're willing to share. They're a little uh, secretive about the actual demographic data, but ECHO per se does not collect demographic data. So I don't see uh, much conflict with the government sharing that with me. When I, let me define what I mean. Demographic means how many patients treated, how many uh, have HIV, how many are male, et cetera. We don't collect that data at all. We collect how many center of excellence are there, how many uh, providers have we trained. That data I'm not finding difficult for the government to give me. And they're not, I, I don't feel that challenge at all. And let me add two more examples to this. One is that one of the other platforms that is rolling out is the national teacher platform, which is being used to train the teachers of India. Uh, that's a platform of the Ministry of HRD, uh, where they are actually sent front and center in the innovation cycles itself. At the moment, we have something like three to five million teachers actually actively learning on the platform, and over time, it's only going to change. Just two weeks ago, the Ministry of uh, uh, Housing and Urban Affairs launched the National Urban Innovation Infrastructure. Uh, and so I think when we're partnering with the government, we're realizing that 
if we create open ecosystems on which different kinds of actors can play and leverage the existing programs and infrastructure of the government, it really has been something that has been progressing quite well. Answering Vishal's question on the change in mindset, uh, one important aspect is this whole question around, there are three important questions to be addressed. One is, who has the mindset to drive this innovation? Because building this infrastructure or building this underlying digital backbone is a lot of investment which is philanthropically driven. It requires different kinds of uh, very high levels of risk capital, it requires very deep talent to be able to build something like this which is at a national scale. And that mindset change is happening increasing in the philanthropic space. And collaborative philanthropy has been one of the approaches in that sense because people are coming together to say, we want to build a solid, robust infrastructure on which not only one program, but many, many programs can be built out over time because it's a shared infrastructure for the society at large. The second important mindset change is co-creation because everybody does co, nobody does creation, right? So people are willing to give their, take ideas, but not really allow people to mess with each other and try to do solutions which really work for the people on the ground. And so that mindset change is a difficult change, otherwise you talk about co-creation, but actually what you do is think this is a great idea and go around distributing the same, thinking everybody should do the same thing. And the third important mindset change is that there is a huge synergy that is lying, and today morning when he talked about the Samaj and Bazaar, similarly there is a mindset between Samaj and Sarkar, Sarkar and Bazaar, and I think those shifts are starting to happen as the common, there is no common playing ground for development that exists today in that sense. And this thinking is one effort and seeing if there is a possible, we don't know whether this is the answer or not, time will tell, right? These are all long-term, uh, so to say, uh, bets that we're making. But the question is, if we can build a persistent infrastructure on which all these actors can connect over time, the mindset starts getting uh, better and better. So these are some of the complex plays Great. at the root of this idea. Yeah, this last question, go ahead. Uh, yeah, this was a great talk. Uh, I'm Rizwan, uh, and I run a healthcare technology company. Uh, a lot of the data sharing and platform that you guys spoke about was more uh, what I would call operational information, you know, number of doctors, number of cases. Uh, that has a natural limitation in terms of what you can really do in terms of uh, quality of care. I'm just curious to know, uh, in terms of just patient data sharing, are there any examples like that that you guys have seen at scale, uh, especially in the Indian context? Yeah. Okay. Um, Echo, like I said, does not collect patient data at all. We do not collect any patient data. Uh, nowhere in any of my, uh, you know, the verticals of my platform do we collect patient data. But we, we do know, maybe combined in a given example, the Punjab government runs this hepatitis C elimination program where they've actually given 1,200 crores for the next 10 years for elimination. They have 6 lakh 600,000 people needing treatment, 25 to 30,000 joining every year, and 1,500 were being treated by the Postgraduate Institute of uh, Medical Sciences in Chandigarh. So they, we approached them and said, all right. So we connected the Postgraduate Institute to 22 district hospitals and three government medical colleges. And they ran the echo session every two weeks for two hours. And after two years, 60,000 plus patients have got treated at the district hospital. Right? That particular data I know because they published it on the website. And the results of both PGI Chandigarh and the district hospital doctor treatment outcomes are exactly the same. And this is published by Dr. Dhiman. But when we went in to look, when we wanted to do a deep dive, we actually found out there are other not-for-profits that actually done the uh, work that you are asking for. Chai, for example, has done an extensive study of the patient profile of hepatitis C in Punjab. So that is available from other people, but not from ECHO. And that's how we collect it, and that's why I gave that example. And just to add a, a quick point to that, uh, we're in the process of working with the Ministry of Health and the National Health Agency to see how do you build a national health stack, which is a national health infrastructure. The strategy paper was out for public consultation for a long period of time to say, how do you deal with uh, a health infrastructure because ECHO addresses one part of the problem. There are many other aspects of health that need to be looked at, and there is a need for a large-scale infrastructure where you can, on one end, ensure that patients' uh, uh, privacy and security are taken care of. At the other end, you have to ensure that you have a good understanding of the entire health system to be able to do something in a much more meaningful way. So that endeavor just began 
uh, a few quarters ago, so it's on its way, but it's in very early stages to look at what kind of a national health infrastructure would India need. Uh, and that's why in the, all these sectors, the objective is to see if we can create national backbones on which many such endeavors can be taken forward. I see the stop sign. And so... On that note, I want to thank you both for this you. wonderful discussion, but more so actually making it real that we can meet and reach a billion people with the support of digital platforms. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.